Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the White House. My name is Megan Phillips. I'm the Director of Digital Strategy here. I'm really excited about the next uh, few minutes we're gonna be able to spend with you uh, taking your questions about the .gov reform uh, effort that's underway. Uh, but before we dive into your questions and really try to get the conversation going, let me uh, uh, let my two uh, guests introduce themselves uh, so you have a little better sense of where they're coming from. Sheila? Hi, I'm Sheila Campbell, and I'm the director for the Center for Excellence in Digital Government at the General Services Administration. Hi, I'm uh, Vivek Kundra, uh, U.S. Chief Information Officer. Great. So uh, we've been spending a lot of time over the last few weeks um, thinking through uh, how to approach um, federal websites, and uh, you are both very uh, uh, experienced in this. Sheila, you, you've been working on this far uh, longer than either <laughs> Vivek or I, even from the previous administrations. Um, so we're looking forward to kind of getting your perspective, but also hearing from a lot of people online. And so let me quickly explain how you can participate. First off, the URL you need to write down now and moving forward to keep track of how things are going with this is usa.gov slash web reform. There's a few things there uh, that you should check out. First is uh, a list of all .gov registered URLs. That's been published in one place on data.gov, uh, but to make it easier to find, there's a link uh, directly to it, uh, again, at usa.gov slash web reform. Uh, in addition, I've got a computer here uh, uh, looking at uh, the hashtag .gov, D-O-T-G-O-V, uh, on Twitter. And that's where I'm going to be pulling in some comments and questions uh, during the chat. I've got a couple uh, that we, uh, we got in ahead of time that I'm going to queue up, but I look forward to hearing what you have to say here. Uh, and just a word of warning ahead of time, um, we all have pins out because I think as you'll hear from our answers, uh, this is just the beginning of a process to really understand um, what the right strategy is for a uh, coherent and, and productive federal web presence. So more than just answering your questions, we're hoping to get a lot of your ideas. Um, and uh, but maybe I should also uh, hand it over to Sheila uh, at the beginning before we get into questions to talk a little bit about uh, the next steps of public engagement that we're going to be doing uh, here in the next few weeks. Great. Thanks, Megan. We have a number of things lined up to ensure that the public has an opportunity to be part of this process. Um, as Megan mentioned, the first step, of course, is that we have uh, just now published the list of all the .gov domains in the federal executive branch on data.gov. And if you go to usa.gov slash web reform, you'll see a link there to uh, where you can go on data.gov. We've enabled uh, comments there. So you, have, you do have to set up a, an account, but as soon as you do, you can go in and see all the other comments that are coming in from across the country, and you can submit your comments. You can take a look at the list and just say, well, you know, this is more than I thought, or this is less than I thought, or whatever your impressions are about the federal web space. If you have opinions about particular websites, we invite your comments. Um, but that's really just the, the initial phase. We know that, in fact, looking at a list of, of .gov domains may not really say much to you, and so, but it may speak to other people. So we want to make sure there are multiple ways to provide input. So providing input on data.gov is just the first step. The second step is that we want to have a more focused, structured conversation uh, that's part of a national uh, web dialogue. And that is going to happen within the next 30 days, uh, most likely on U as part of USA.gov. And it will be similar to uh, uh, the Open Government Directive, where we invited public feedback on that process as well. And so in that, it will be an open dialogue where you'll be able to see comments coming in from other people. And it will be a more structured uh, discussion with specific questions. And we haven't actually, in fact, figured out those questions just yet. Um, but that's why we're actually looking at the Twitter feed, looking at um, the White House Facebook page and other comments that are coming in today and over the next week that will help inform the questions that we want to ask as part of this national dialogue. Cool. Well, let's kick it off with one question we've gotten a lot, and I think it'll be something both of you might be able to, to speak to. It comes from Luke Fretwell, who, uh, who asked, why doesn't the federal government consolidate the .gov ecosystem into one portal, CMS, consistent brand, under USA.gov? So, Vivek, do you want to kick that off? Sure. So I think that's a, that's a great idea, but I think it's important uh, if I could just jump into the history of how the federal government uh, moved uh, to the digital world. So if you remember, in the mid-90s, there's a huge push to actually get every single agency, bureau, department, and success was defined by actually having a website. Um, as we fast forward now to 2011, and we reflect on over the last decade in terms of what's actually been happening across the public sector and the private sector. What we've noticed is a huge revolution in terms of how services are delivered. Um, if you think about it in the private sector context, 
what used to happen was actually you actually had on the back end people who would take physical customer service orders and the private sector had this debate around, well, you can't really trust customers to fill orders themselves. That's why they built this massive infrastructure on the back end. Very quickly, the private sector innovated and you had self-service options, whether it's reserving your favorite restaurant online through OpenTable or it's booking an airline ticket online. The public sector, unfortunately, there's been a gap when it comes to information technology and it's more prevalent than ever between the public and private sector. And what we're trying to do now is actually rationalize that as we look at these digital assets across the federal government. It makes no sense, we recognize that having over 24,000 websites and having the American people navigate this jungle of 24,000 websites absolutely makes no sense. The question before us is what is the right answer and how do we get there? We absolutely know the right answer is not 24,000 plus websites. That is why this task force has been set up. That is why the president focused on this issue by uh, putting in place an executive order that uh, simplifies access to government services and focuses the federal agencies to make sure that they're not self-organizing for their own convenience, but that we're, at, we're taking meaningful steps to make it easy for the American people to access government services. Why don't I turn it over to Sheila to talk about some examples elsewhere around the world. Thanks, Vivek. Uh, as Vivek mentioned, there, what we're trying to do as part of this effort is to look at comparable examples. And over the last several months, we've been connecting with other governments around the world who have gone through a similar effort. We've spoken with the folks in the United Kingdom. Uh, for the past several years, they've been looking at trying to consolidate their websites into a single uh, portal. And we want to go back to them and ask them if it's working, um, what's working well, what's not working well with that effort. I think the jury's still out. And that's why we want to go back to them and, and, and learn from their, their successes and from, from their lessons learned. Uh, we've also spoken with the state of California. Um, those of you uh, listening in from California may know that um, you've gone through a, a big effort yourself to consolidate all the different um, department websites within California, and they're an excellent model for us to look at as well. Uh, but also there are examples outside of government. Um, the World Bank is also a, a vast um, organization, and they have had hundreds if not thousands of websites that they've also been trying to um, get a, a better handle on. And so we've been speaking with um, those organizations and we have a lot to learn and that's one of the key questions as part of this process is to get input on whether that's the right solution or if there are other solutions. Uh, USA.gov is uh, the official portal for the US government. It has access to all the government um, content across the federal government and so we're excited to see whether um, what role that, that site's going to play uh, in, in the next few years. Great. Well, uh one of, the, uh, one of the other common questions we're getting, I just want to kind of bang out some of the popular ones so folks can uh, kind of move on to, to maybe follow-up questions, is about what happens to sites that get consolidated. And I think um, um, it's a very valid concern. Um, you know, people don't want to lose content, and I think it's important to emphasize that um, this effort isn't about um, uh, turning off sites. Um, in fact, this, this effort is really fueled by uh, eliminating waste making sure that we're not doing things that are redundant, um, but actually making it easier to find government services and information. Uh, so a lot of the sites that I think we'll uh, be able to identify over the coming weeks and months are sites that actually will be uh, better served by being part of a larger site where traffic's already going, and making sure that content's uh, available to people. Uh, but just to kind of put a finer point on it, let me ask uh, two related questions to you, Vivek. Uh, first comes from uh, Daniel Schumann, who says, if websites are cut, what's being done to make sure the public information is, is, isn't taken offline? Uh, and then a, a similar question that came from Kathy uh, through our site started off by saying a very interesting initiative. What are you doing to ensure that when you eliminate websites that the information content is not lost? Also, how do you ensure that if you have fewer websites that they don't get too complicated or organizationally difficult for Americans to use? What criteria will you be using to determine which websites you will be eliminating? Sure, so uh, on the first part of the question, um, you know, unlike the private sector, the government uh, has a unique set of requirements, especially when it comes to records management. Uh, statutes mandate that the federal government uh, maintain records, and the National Archives has been doing a lot of work in this space. And that has been, frankly, one of the challenges as we look at digital content that's been created in the past, where agencies have gone from end-to-end -end paper processes to end-to-end -end digital processes, and we have a lot of content that's born digital. 
So part of what the task force is going to be doing is looking at that and making sure that no records are lost as we migrate or consolidate uh, these websites. Secondly, I think it's also very important to look at a huge tectonic shift that's taken place um, within information technology and how the American people interact with their government, which is that more and more users are uh, leveraging mobile devices to access their government. Last year, fourth quarter, for the first time, mobile devices outpaced in terms of sales compared to desktops. And part of what this task force is also going to be doing is looking at uh, how do we make sure that we're prepared uh, to serve the American people in the context that they want to deal with their government rather than us just pushing uh, uh, websites. And in terms of optimizing content and how it's presented, well, if you look at a lot of these websites, I've got to tell you, you know, it's uh, disappointing when you look at them and you realize that they've been designed with uh, folks that were thinking about information architecture from the 1980s or 1990s. And part of what we're going to be doing is making sure that we're looking at game-changing technologies to be able to serve up content. And those game-changing technologies, part of what we want to be able to do is make sure that they're used to simplify access. So search is the native way how most people access information. Why isn't that the default? And those are the types of questions we're going to be looking at. Absolutely. A big part of this effort, um, in addition to posting the data set on data.gov, is that agencies are going to be asked to complete a comprehensive inventory of all of their .gov uh, domains. And that's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. And agencies will be, be required to ask uh, to, to answer uh, important questions about every single domain that they own. So. Uh, questions like who owns the website, when was it last up updated, what's the purpose of the site, who's the audience, what are the top tasks. So it's really going to be a very comprehensive review so that agencies can, can look at this data and make sound business decisions as to what the next step is with that website. Uh, they're going to be looking not just at individual websites but also websites across their organization to identify opportunities for um, reducing duplication. So for example, uh, agencies will be looking at the, the content, uh, they'll be looking at the infrastructure, They'll be looking at um, how all the different services that go into maintaining that website and look for opportunities for a more cost-efficient way of managing their website. So um, that's going to happen over the next couple of months. Agencies are going to be required to complete that inventory by the end of October. And then as part of their customer service plans, they're going to be uh, required to publicly explain what they're planning to do with each of these websites. So again, it's not a willy-nilly approach. It's, it's a very concerted uh, effort based on, on data, and that's a really fundamental part to this whole entire effort is we want to make sure that agencies are looking at, at good data to make these decisions. And just to, just to yeah. add to that, yeah. you know, part of what we also want to do is uh, we want to make sure that if people aren't coming to websites and we're spending a lot of money that uh, in the interest of taxpayer dollars we're going to shut those websites down if it makes absolutely no sense. If you're spending millions of dollars and you get one visitor a year, uh, that's part of what Sheila's talking exactly. about in terms of looking at data, looking at analytics, and uh, making sure for websites where there's no traffic um, that we actually make the tough decisions because in this fiscal environment there's no room to continue to throw good money after bad money. Yeah. And the key is we really want to be strategic about it. So we're not only going to look at how much web traffic a site is getting, because in some cases it may not get as much traffic as an, another website, but it may be serving its intended audience. But the key thing with a lot of this is there tends to be a t there's a tendency to anytime someone has a new initiative to set up a new website and that's the kind of thing that we want we want to stop and a lot of what's happening is agencies haven't been leveraging their existing resources and what we found in talking with with search experts and, and others is that what we've done is we're we're actually negatively impacting how people can find information via search because with all of these different URLs and domains we're actually competing against each other against you know with other websites in the federal space um, for for good search results so that's one of the things we want to address is to really leverage those websites that are already getting a lot of traffic and putting the content there, where it makes sense. So a few, um, a few follow-ups to that, but I, I actually want to throw in my two cents. This is kind of difficult because usually I'm just <laughs> the person teeing up the questions, but I also want to try to pay attention. Um, I think we all know, um, uh, we all know Alex Howard, uh, Digifile, but he posed a follow-up question um, to what you just said, that search is the way uh, uh, people uh, search for info now. Uh, it's what you just said. So why isn't that the default? Um, and and I, I think what's interesting to point out to people is that 
solving the problem of making government information and services more available online isn't just about better websites. It's to uh, Alex's point about understanding how people are getting this information. So uh, one of the really exciting projects that GSA is working on is Search USA. And I think that's a really good example of approaching this problem not just from a narrow standpoint of building better websites, but thinking of, like more holistically about the uh, citizens' experience in terms of getting federal information. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of Search USA and some of the goals of that project. Sure, yeah, I, I think that's a really important point because the USA.gov search engine is an example, like you said, Macon, where it doesn't make sense for you know dozens of agencies, hundreds of agencies to go out there and buy their own um, search engine, purchase their own search engine. And that's why we've created the USA search program that about 400 agencies are now using. And it's a free tool. Um, the benefits are is that GSA maintains it, and we upgrade it, and we manage it centrally so that, again, dozens of agencies don't have to do the work themselves. And that's really the role of the General Services Administration as sort of the you know, federal manager of the government is that we, you know, we can leverage those resources across government and, and create a more efficient way of, of sharing resources. So that's been a very successful program. We're really upgrading that search. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and we're going around to agencies, and, and I think they're, they're really seeing the value of those kind of shared tools, and that's something we want to certainly do more of. Great. And just to, to, to add uh, one more thing uh, to Alex's question about search and it being the default, to support your point, um, there was a website called hospitalcompare.gov, uh, which was being run by CMS, and it basically contained data about hospitals and outcomes and how patients rated that hospital based on uh, their visit. And uh, for years, it had very low traffic. But as soon as that data was democratized uh, and there was a competition run, an apps competition, what uh, Bing did is it took that data and actually made it part of its search results. So if you went online and typed Georgetown Hospital or George Washington Hospital, you would actually see right on the search box uh, how patients rated that uh, hospital, and you would also see outcomes based on the specific operations and all the hospitals nearby. So part of what we also have to think about and consider is how much of, of this does the government have to build in terms of platforms versus how much of it is uh, very much around leveraging private sector platforms that may already exist and the government playing a role of actually putting that information out there and letting third parties create some really, really innovative uses of that information. It's great. It's great. Uh, one of the uh, pieces of feedback we got during your earlier uh, answer, uh, Vivek, was from a, um, actually a, a web designer who um, is, is watching us and tweeting as she is. Um, Heather Phillips, no relation, um, uh, creative Heather, she said, uh, Government has a unique set of requirements, spells. It's going to take 20 plus years to do this .gov, make it open. So can you talk a little bit about what people should expect from this project over the next weeks and months, sort of what we have laid out? Sure. Uh, well, so now that we've got the data set out there, and we hope that you all are going to USA.gov slash web reform to see the link to the, the data set, um, we have a number of things that are the next steps. Um, the first thing is we've, we've set up a task force called the DuckGov Task Force, um, and the list of the members are on the USA.gov uh, page. And that's a, a really talented group of folks that um, have been thinking about these issues for, um, for a long time, but plus some people who are relatively new to government have some fresh perspective fresh perspective, so it's web managers and, and, and uh, chief information officers and designers and creative people. And we're gonna be um, meeting over the, uh, over the coming months to get public input on this process. Um, so in addition to publishing the list on data.gov, we'll be doing the, the website inventory. Um, but another big piece is that we're also going to be looking at, um, at federal web policies and best practices. Uh, there, there's a set of web policies that have been um, in existence since 2004. And was that uh, seven years ago now? Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously a lot has changed uh, uh, in, in, those, in that time. And so it's time to, to update those, those policies. So that's a big piece of what the, the group is going to do. And that's certainly where we want to get a lot of um, public input and especially input from, um, from folks outside of government. And we really want a, a wide range of, of voices. We want to hear from people in the tech industry, but we want to also hear from students and teachers and librarians and um, people in other countries who have done similar efforts. So we really want to make it a, a very, very broad um, uh, 
area where we can get, get input from lots of different voices. And so um, strengthening our web, web policies and best practices is a big piece. The other thing we're going to be looking at is, is more of those, these common tools. I think that's really where um, we have a huge area of, of potential growth. And in addition to the USA Search, we want to look at, you know, maybe there's an opportunity for developing some common design templates. Uh, maybe there is an opportunity for other shared services that we can provide to agencies, such as, you know, captioning of, of videos or language translation and other services. And so that's why we need a, a broad input um, on, how, on how to deliver those shared services. But I think on the design piece, the reason why that's so key is that we have so many different designs. I mean, you mentioned the 24,000 websites. I don't know how many of those have, have unique designs, but it's mm -hmm. a lot. So not just separate infrastructure, but sep separate designs. And with web teams, with their limited resources, they're spending too much time on the design and less amount of time as they should on content. And content is really king on the mm -hmm. web. So Heather, uh, you know, I agree with you in terms of uh, the government um, officials sometimes do use that as one of the biggest excuses not to get anything done. But uh, that is why if you look at what we're doing is we've set specific deadlines, we've committed to specific goals, we've put together a team that's government wide that's very, very focused on execution rather than just talk. Um, just to give you this, the magnitude of the problem here, for example, just as a data point, Every month, right, as we looked at the data, uh, agencies across the federal government uh, register historically 15 new domain names. Uh, and that's been halted, right? That's 15 new domain names every single month, which has been frozen. And that is why we would love to get your ideas uh, in terms of how we can make sure that we keep this focus in execution and also what you would like to see uh, out of this effort, uh, you know, as Sheila mentioned, part of what we intend to do is make sure that we're actively engaging uh, the outside community. And it sounds like you actually know some of the uh, challenges across the federal government in terms of the excuses that are used. Yeah, so let me jump in here with a few others. I'm gonna try to knock out a few quick ones. Uh, a mom of four asks on Twitter, uh, what about subsites? Are they part of .gov? And this is this is kind of an interesting one. I think it's a very logical one. There's um, the 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 short answer is yes, but the longer answer is we're trying to start with a focus on just the top level URLs. Uh, that's a list that we're fortunate to have because uh, GSA controls the provisioning of those URLs, and so it's it's a starting point from which we can work uh, forward. But uh, none of us are under the illusion that that's all the sites. In fact, you have a lot of subdomains uh, that are actually discrete websites that have a very different look and feel and sometimes uh, back-end infrastructure than the top-level domain. Um, uh, and, and of course with insights there's also um, sub-sites and coming through all of those uh, is going to be a, a time-consuming process and I think that's why uh, Sheila laid out earlier it's really important that the agencies provide that initial look uh, at their own uh, web presence because they, they know it better than anyone else. Uh, and, and can give us that feedback. So that's, that's one. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Okay, so that was pretty good. Someone asked why we're using plastic cups and not recycled ones, so I'm going to look into that uh, when, we get, <laughs> when we get done. She loves uh, fault. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is, yes. But, uh, you know, one, uh, one other thing, not to dwell too much on Heather, but, but she said, thanks for putting my comment out there. It's definitely time to update the policies. Great answer, but how do we give input? Um, and I think that's a very fair question. For all the folks that are tuning in late, I, I think it's important to reiterate um, Heather had also mentioned that in, in addition to web stats, we should also look at usability studies. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you pointed out, there's a whole host of tools that we can use to inform this. The private sector knows this better than we do. Uh, th this is not, we are not the cutting edge of websites. That is happening in the private sector. That's why projects like data.gov are so important because as much as we may talk about cool mobile apps, I think we can all agree that the best mobile apps are going to be uh, driven by the public sector, or rather sort of nonprofits, private sector, making use of right. government data, maybe mashing it up with other things, but uh, that we need to recognize where we are good and where we aren't. Uh, and so one of the areas that we could really use a lot of feedback is, just from a very uh, initial step, how should we be thinking about assessing sites? What are the, what are the best ways uh, to assess the usability uh, of a site uh, and to sort of think about information architecture for enterprise as large uh, as the U.S. government? So uh, for all the folks out there who've done a lot of work in e-commerce, who've done work at institutions like colleges, uh, who've done work, uh, we've talked to the World Bank. And there's a number of these folks who've dealt with similar problems. We really want to hear from you. So to Heather's question, uh, obviously the .gov uh, hashtag is one that we're going to be keeping an eye on moving forward. 
uh, and then the URL, usa.gov slash web reform, uh, has a link to the data.gov uh, set where you can give some un unstructured comments. And in the coming uh, weeks, we're going to have a much more robust public engagement. And we really hope that you spend the time until then to really think through the ways you can contribute to this because we're going to need everyone to really tackle this problem. Um, let me kind of let me continue on to, uh, to another question. Uh, this is one I think that, that deserves to be pointed out, and, and this gets into uh, really into your wheelhouse, uh, Vivek, gets at sort of the difference between website and infrastructure. You know, when we talk about URLs and the content on it, but I think also people think about servers and all the things that, uh, that, that keep those up. So, I pulled one earlier. Okay, uh, Tori Adler asked, domain consolidation seems like a good idea, but doesn't really address cost cutting. Data farm consolidation would save money. So can you just, I know you can go on for, for a while on this topic, but maybe give us a quick thumbnail about how this, how the URL piece relates to infrastructure and then maybe a little bit about the larger effort you're doing there. Sure, so if you look at uh, the government's move um, when it comes to the digital world, part of uh, what the federal government has tried to do is leverage web scale efficiencies um, in terms of delivering services. So it's very hard uh, to figure out, you know, where does a website start or stop and where does a back end set of systems begin? So if you think about it, the United States government operates uh, over 12,000 major systems, everything from processing taxes on the back end uh, at the IRS to making sure social security uh, checks are administered properly at the SSA. Uh, to homeland security systems uh, are on making sure we're connecting the dots. Uh, the reason this is so important is because on a day-to-day -day basis, the American people don't really interact directly with those back-end systems. The vehicle for interacting with government services is uh, to the, through the web layer. And uh, the efforts underway as part of the administration's IT reform agenda have been to actually go after the very duplication that you're pointing out. Uh, we've seen a rise in the number of data centers go from 432 to over 2,000 in a decade. Uh, average utilization in those data centers when it comes to CPUs is under 27%. Average storage utilization is under 40%. That is why we're actually shutting down 800 data centers as we speak. We've already shut down 39 of them. We're going to finish shutting down 137 um, of uh, these data centers by the end of this calendar year. Uh, but the front end, which is what the American people have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, you can't really logically navigate 24,000 websites. That is why this effort is so important. And unfortunately, because most agencies have spent majority of their time building this duplicative, redundant, underutilized set of assets, they really haven't thought about, well, how do we organize ourselves to make it simpler for the American people, rather than building silo after silo, department after department. And part of our IT reform agenda actually uh, attacks also how we fund federal IT. If you think about our, how Congress appropriates funding, it's bureau by bureau, department by department, agency by agency, that continues to breed this duplicative infrastructure whether we're talking about websites or data centers or financial systems or HR systems. Uh, one of the questions that we, um, that we just got um, reminds me of a story that I think is sort of uh, relevant here and, and hopefully we'll give folks uh, some pause to think about how they can contribute. It came from uh, Joy Fulton um, who uh, asks, can we help by providing .com, web .com websites that are actually .gov websites? So I think it gets at more of the what can people do to sort of prototype things maybe or, or sort of work on these, these issues. Um, and and I, I want to take a few minutes just to explain a little bit of the backstory about healthcare.gov, uh, which is a really interesting uh, example. Uh, before healthcare.gov was a project uh, that uh, Todd Park, at CT, uh, the CTO at uh, HHS, is really driving, um, there were a lot of conversations about what that site could look like. And uh, a web designer in New Jersey actually put together his idea of what that could look like based on just what he had read in the news and what he had studied up uh, in terms of the different drafts of the law and then once the law had been passed or what he understood it to be. Uh, and that had such a fresh uh, information architecture, it had such a fresh aesthetic uh, that the HHS team actually ended up uh, working with him to actually implement healthcare.gov, uh, which I think uh, has been widely viewed as uh, a fresh site that actually does a good job displaying information and delivering services. 
Uh, and that would be a really terrific project uh, uh, for folks to work on. Uh, you know, I know that takes time, but uh, to my earlier point about uh, thinking through the big issues of how we organize govern government information, it's a pretty uh, challenging uh, uh, prospect. Um, one of the uh, questions Tori Adler asked is, is consolidation a foregone conclusion? Why would we want school kids and tax lawyers at all to have to sort through one site? So to, I think, the earlier point we made, we're not, certainly don't think that a single site is a foregone conclusion. Um, but uh, to your point, uh, school kids and tax lawyers are both important constituencies, uh, important uh, folks that need to get uh, information from the government. We need to think about how they can actually uh, get at that information. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about topics and sort of maybe how GSA and USA.gov has thought about this and the difference between a corporate site or sort of an agency site versus a, a task-oriented site? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Actually, before I touch on that, I just want, I don't want to lose the, the good ideas that, that um, people are asking around the, the data set uh, on data.gov because I think that, that there's a huge opportunity for public input in terms of when we have the data set out there, there's a lot of really rich discoveries to be made there that, um, and that's why we're putting it out there. So we'd love to have developers and other smart people download the data set and you know, perhaps even you know, map the federal web space, which has never been done before. I think there's huge opportunities there for people to take the, the list of domains and say, hey, here are all the, the websites on, on this particular topic, or here's where there are redundancies, and just to discover some things that you know, we, we don't have information on right now. And I think that would be very, very helpful as, we, as agencies do their, their individual inventories uh, to have that kind of input from, from the public. But in terms of um, how websites have evolved you know, topically versus organizationally, there's been a huge shift over the years. And I think this is where we can really cite some, some progress. I think if you look at federal websites 10 years ago, even five years ago, they were very much based on the organization of the, the agency. Uh, and and we've, we've seen a, a major change there. And now if you go to most federal agency homepages, they really are prominently showing the top tasks. Um, the top online services and transactions that you can do. And, and, and that's a, actually a great step forward. And I think that's the kind of thing that we want to look at, whether, you know, what sort of successes we've seen and where can we replicate the, those good practices. And so I do think that as part of this whole effort, um, we have an opportunity to look at those models um, for delivering content that, that work really well. Great. Um, let's uh, maybe find a, a related one uh, that came from CN Dawson. Uh, who says, review of .gov site top tasks needs to recognize that some tasks are not actions, but getting basic information and publications. Can you talk about sort of the, content, the, the, the concept of top tasks and how that applies to this whole process? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, top tasks is, is critical. I mean, that's really ultimately what this, this whole effort is about, is helping improve the online customer experience. And the vast majority of people are, are oftentimes actually trying to accomplish the same basic tasks. I mean, there are... Um, when you look at the top tasks across government, it's you know millions of people are applying for a passport, or they're applying for student financial aid, or they're looking for health information, uh, or they're looking for a small business loan. Um, there, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to improve those those tasks that the vast majority of people are doing, and this is where we've been working real closely with the Federal Web Managers Council to ensure that we're really optimizing that content. Not to say that the other content's not important. It's just that you know I think if we have limited resources and we can't do everything overnight. We should be prioritizing around those tasks that the most that most people are are trying to do every day, and and this is where I think the you know the, the task force comes in and, and why it's so important is that right now with all the with with thousands of, of separate websites with, with the, the impact on search is you know you type in a search result and you're getting dozens of, of results on, on one topic and this is where I think we have an opportunity it's not so much about consolidating websites but doing a better job of getting rid of duplicate content across within a website and across websites so that when you're going to look for information you're getting one authoritative source uh, which is the answer to your question great um, uh, we, uh, uh, Becky Kazansky, who actually was just down here uh, uh, for the last week's Twitter event, um, pointed out something I'm sure a lot of people are frustrated by. She said, the problem with this conversational .gov event via White House is that getting a question through feels too much like winning the lottery. Sure, and there's a lot of questions coming in and we're not able to get to all of them. I think one thing uh, uh, to point out is that uh, we're certainly active on Twitter. Uh, you're you're uh, at Sheila Campbell. Right? Actually, at Sheila DC USA. All right, easy to remember. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I can so, no, 
Uh, just go back and look at our feed. That'll be there. Uh, and I'm. Jill Campbell's already taken. Okay. It's a common name. More uh, common than Megan Phillips. <laughs> well, we're both we're both out there. You can find us. And I'm in Megan 44. And, and I think that's uh, you know while we're taking the time to really focus on it right now, uh, you know as we move forward, uh, that's a great way to sort of stay in touch with us. And we'll try to go back through, take a look at a lot of the questions that we uh, missed. Uh, and, uh, and, and respond to those. Uh, and then to some of the earlier points that were made, it's a great way to get us uh, feedback, particularly until we get this more robust uh, public dialogue uh, set up at usa.gov slash web reform. Let me uh, ask one more question here uh, that I think gets at both of your backgrounds. Uh, and maybe you can explain a little bit about how you're approaching this problem, uh, because it really is important that we're getting both the technology and the content uh, piece of this uh, mashed up. Mike Rupert asks, this seems to be a CIO-driven initiative. Where do content creators, owners, fit in? So is it a CIO-driven initiative? Well, it can't be based on just um, one entity, right, within uh, agencies. And what I mean by that is uh, because the way I look at it, um, and my background also, by the way, at uh, the state level, city level, state, uh, state city, and now federal, uh, recognizes that you know we're going to have to get everybody around the table because this is going to mean meaningful discussions around how we actually fund IT projects, which is going to involve the president's management council and the deputy secretaries. We're going to have to make sure that uh, the program managers, the people that are operating these multi-million, multi-billion dollar IT projects in the back end, that they're part of this. And uh, it's going to mean that the web managers and the CIOs are actually around the table. Uh, it's not going to be just a content conversation or a CIO conversation because it's much, much bigger and it's going to require a fundamental reform of how we actually manage information technology across the federal government. Absolutely. I think for too many years at, at many agencies, the web has not been seen as a strategic asset. It's sort of, you know, been relegated to, oh, it's the HTML coders, you know, down in the basement. And I think now we've seen that the power of the web and social media to help accomplish our, our missions and, and better engage with the public. And so I think we're in a whole new era where we have to engage everybody within an organization. Uh, it's not just the, the web folks, not just the new media folks, it's the chief financial officers who are you know, managing the budget, but it's also the program folks. I mean, if you're a program manager at NOAA or at EPA or at State Department um, and you have a business problem that you're trying to solve, uh, it, there's huge potential to say, hey, how can I use the web? How can I use social media? How can I use all these online tools to help you know, better solve my problem, help better engage with the public? So I think that um, what's exciting about this .gov reform effort is that we really are trying to take a comprehensive view. We're trying to include all the different stakeholders across organizations, uh, across agencies, but not just within government, but um, outside of government as well. And I think that's what's really going to make this succeed, is making sure it's not as sort of an isolated, insular activity. And just to speak about stakeholders, it, it does also include the state and local level, because one of the most popular searches on USA.gov is actually around driver's licenses. Um, and uh, driver's licenses are actually issued at the state level. And if you think about it, the average person, if they're starting a business, for example, uh, right now the process is they've got to navigate uh, the complicated bureaucratic processes at their county, their state, and then the federal government. We need to be able to abstract those layers and uh, make sure that we're organizing government around the American people, not the other way around. Great. Um, okay, so we had another question from Jay Grandin. Um, it says, Sheila, the initial announcement said the 2,000 URLs fanned out to 24,000 websites. So can you talk a little bit about how, how we're counting websites? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad that question is asked because it is, it is complicated, even for those of us who've been you know, working on this for right. a couple of months. Um, so when you look at the list of .gov domains on data.gov, you'll see there are about 1,700. And those are the, um, the, the, the top level uh, .gov domains in the federal executive branch. Of those, there are about there are 355 uh, what are considered redirects. And those are actually not bona fide websites. Those are URLs that have been reserved to point to other websites. Um, so those are the two, two, two numbers. But then when we talk about um, websites, that's actually you know, a much larger number. Because within a domain, say NASA.gov or USDA.gov, you can have 
uh, lots and lots of, of subsites and microsites. And so when we say 24,000, it's because within those domains, there are oftentimes many unique websites with unique designs and infrastructure. So um, that's the difference between the, the numbers is that there's about 1,700 um, domains, but within that, there are many, many more actual um, individual websites. Does great. that help? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Do you have anything else you want to add there? Um, okay. One of the one of the other questions that came that I think is a good uh, chance for you to plug the web managers generally as a resource uh, is uh, Janet BS asks, how can IT and web managers better collaborate across government to leverage best practices, lessons learned, improve service together? So if you're a government employee that wants to participate here, what's the best way to plug in? That's great. Um, well, there's a number of ways to plug in. Um, there's a, a very large network of federal, state, and local, and, and state and local folks are a very important part of this process. Uh, so if you go to um, howto.gov, there's a place there where you can be part of that community. And uh, that's a very, very active community where we're sharing best practices, we're sharing information about a training program that we manage. Uh, we manage a very large program where we offer web and online webinars and in-person training sessions on every aspect of managing federal websites and new media. So if you're not sure on you know, how to set up a, what are the, what's the criteria for setting up a good website or how to do usability testing, there's lots of resources available to you. So you can participate in the community, you can get access to best practices and the training and, and the shared tools. Terrific. Well, I'm, I'm trying to keep up with uh, what folks are saying here. It looks like people are already doing interesting things with the uh, URL data, so I look forward to seeing what comes up there. And I know you uh, both need to run, and so we're gonna wrap this up. And I, I think a good comment that came in from Michael Aleo kind of sums up, uh, uh, you know, at least how we feel about this, which is uh, .gov. Are there any opponents of this initiative? Opening data, making data easier to find, spending less. Seems like a win-win-win. So I, I, uh, I'm very excited about this project. I can't stress enough that um, we aren't going to solve this problem, just the three of us, or just the, the task force that's been put together, that um, this is uh, uh, almost a medium is the message uh, piece uh, in some ways where we're really trying to make sure we are developing an online program and an online engagement around this project that helps reflect some of the best practices for the federal government moving forward. Uh, and you can keep track of that at usa.gov slash web reform. Uh, and we really look forward to hearing back from, your, uh, from you about ideas, uh, questions that we should be asking, uh, examples of things that we can learn from, uh, and just generally your feedback uh, as we move forward. Do you have any uh, last words you want to? Yeah, I, I think we, the, the area that uh, I would especially emphasize is uh, help us think through how we're able to actually provide services over the mobile internet. I think that's going to be one of the most important areas and how we go about making sure that uh, we're serving your needs. Uh, as Macon said, uh, we don't have a monopoly on the best ideas and uh, we look to you uh, to provide us some game-changing ideas to help improve your government. Sheila? I would like to just add to that and to say that uh, we don't want to look too narrowly at this either because I think that we keep talking about websites and our sense of websites as we know them today, but you know, I think two or three years from now, uh, it's, it's really part of the larger information ecosystem. And so I think we need to even be thinking beyond how do we manage websites, how do we manage our content on social media sites, third party sites, and the, the overall um, online presence for agencies. Cool. Terrific. So thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, again, that URL, I've tried to say it uh, uh, 30 times, uh, <laughs> is usa.gov slash web reform. You can keep track uh, of our progress there. Uh, you can figure out ways uh, you can give us feedback there. And you can also check out the uh, list of URLs that's been published to data.gov. There's a link uh, directly to that list uh, from usa.gov slash web reform. So thanks, everyone, and have a great day.